New Jersey is emerging from the pandemic. Where are we headed? We asked the only CPA in the legislature. This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and welcome to Episode 72. As we all know too well, the coronavirus pandemic has wreaked personal havoc on the people of New Jersey. It has also devastated the state's small businesses and the economy. But as more and more people get vaccinated, businesses are reopening, and the economy seems to be picking up. On top of that, New Jersey just received a whopping $6.4 billion from the American Rescue Plan. So what happens now? Where is the economy headed? What should the state do with the billions it received from the feds? And what can New Jersey do to help businesses get back on their feet? I'll be discussing all of this with Senator Stephen Oroho, who represents New Jersey's 24th legislative district and is the senior Republican on the Senate Budget Committee. We are proud to say that Senator Oroho is a CPA and a longstanding NJCPA member. And he knows more about fiscal and financial issues than probably anyone in the legislature. In addition to serving in the legislature, he has a full-time job as a financial planner for Stonebridge Capital Management. Senator Oroho is respected by and works well with both sides of the aisle. In fact, he has an excellent relationship with Senate President Steve Sweeney, even though Sweeney is a Democrat. On top of all of this, Senator Oroho is just a really great guy. What more could you ask for in the only CPA in the legislature? Welcome, Senator. Glad to have you as a guest again. Hey, Jeff. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. With the devastation wreaked by the coronavirus pandemic, the economic outlook is top of mind to millions of individuals and probably every single business owner in the country. So since I know you're a CPA and a financial planner, let's start with the economy. We surveyed our members in May and we asked them if they thought that economic conditions in the United States for the rest of 2021 will be better, about the same, or worse than the first five months of 2021. 44% said better, 26% said about the same, and 30% said worse. But two prominent investment banks have a somewhat different view. Goldman Sachs predicts the U.S. economy will grow 8% this year, and unemployment will drop to 4% by the end of the year. And the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase predicts robust recovery through 2023. So our members don't seem to be as optimistic as the investment banks. Senator, where do you think we're headed? Well, Jeff, I I do agree that we're going to see uh, additional growth. I don't know if uh, New Jersey, um, that's why I guess the uh, investment banks are probably looking more across the the country. Um, I do expect New Jersey will have some growth as well. Um, You know, certainly coming out of the pandemic where everything has been, New Jersey's had some of the most draconian lockdown uh, provisions uh, in, in the country. So, you know, um, I think in any kind of scenario, there's going to be uh, some growth. Now, there's significant business. There's a lot of small businesses that, quite frankly, um, I'm sure either completely out of capital run or running low on capital. So that has a, you know, that certainly would have an impact of having somebody uh, having a little bit more of a, um, you know, a, a, a dire outlook because their time frame is hey, if I don't get going shortly, I'm going to be out of business. Right, right. So we also asked about the economy here in New Jersey, and our members that we surveyed were even more pessimistic than they were about the national economy, with only 35% saying they expect the state economy to improve during the remainder of 2021. And more than 60% said that state and federal policies unfriendly to businesses, quote, 
is one of their top three challenges. So what do you think are the three most important actions the state can take over the next year, next 12 months, to help small businesses? Well, Jeff, thank you very much. And, and quite frankly, there's a reason why the New Jersey businesses are more pessimistic, because when the CARES Act money came out, it was obviously that was to be used specifically to help our small businesses, our nonprofits. And unfortunately, the Murphy administration held on to the purse strings for, you know, for way, way, way too long. Um, now, I do think some things, and now we have the American Rescue Plan coming, and I do think that the first thing they can do, because July 1st, you know, I know the Murphy administration and the majority party, the Democrat Party, is basically saying there's no tax increases in the budget this year. It's an election year budget type of thing. Um, but that's not really true, because there is a tax thing. It's just not in the budget itself, and it's the unemployment trust fund, and that's going to hit all businesses. So the first thing we can do, and, and the Senate Republicans and the Assembly Republicans have been saying for a long time, along with our business community has been saying for a long time, get money into the uh, unemployment uh, trust fund. Now, we do have right now a, um, a no interest loan from the federal government. So the idea of trying to get money right away into the unemployment uh, uh, trust fund before July 1st, before that tax increase, um, would be a significant improvement for our small businesses. So I think that's the first thing that they, uh, they can do. The uh, American Rescue Plan, obviously we had a significant amount of money in, in there. Uh, along with the CARES Act money, um, a lot more money could have gone directly helping our small businesses, our nonprofits. So that's the next thing we could do. And I would say the third thing, I actually have more than three, but this, I'll go with three. I knew you would. <laughs> I'll, go with, I'll go with three. We got to get our schools open because our small businesses need employees to come back. And then once our schools are open, they can't go back. As you alluded to, uh, New Jersey is receiving uh, uh, an incredibly huge chunk of money from the American Rescue Plan, about $6.4 billion. And uh, what I think some people are forgetting is uh, our local governments are also going to be receiving a lot of money, about $4 billion. And this money has to be spent over the next three years. So since this money can't be used to pay down debt or reduce taxes, how do you think the state should spend this money? Well, Jeff, thank you. And uh, this is something we, the, the Senate Republicans actually put out a plan. Now, there's different ways. Right now, the, the state has a significant uh, cash surplus on hand. Um, so we could view, let's, starting with the, the uh, funds that they received on the, what we said was completely unconstitutional borrowing of about $4.3 billion. Obviously, that money is still sitting there. Unfortunately, they made it non-callable for 12 years. But um, some of the cash we have is, is there is an ability, and I say, to fees some of the debt that's out there. That essentially set up a, uh, a sinking fund or some sort of um, you know lockbox that that we can help uh, you know offset some of the debt. Now, with respect to the American Care, the American Rescue Plan, we actually did put out a very um, a detailed plan. It basically said we you know we would take you know two and a half billion of that. And like I said, the first thing uh, in in the three things we talked about for the small business is put it into the uh, unemployment insurance trust fund. And what that will do is allow us to pay off the federal loan when the interest, as soon as it starts becoming interest bearing, then we should pay it off. And I think that's sometime in September, right? But then also uh, the extra, say a billion and a half over the next three years to help eliminate, there's um, a, a tax increase. Now the legislature did spread it out over a three year period and the governor did sign it, but it's still a major tax increase on our businesses to get our unemployment uh, trust fund back in, in decent shape. So we can easily, and that's very clear that that money can be used for that. So that'd be the 2.5 billion. You have, we'd say another uh, 1.5 billion for capital projects. Wait, um, I'm sorry, let me, maybe I, did you sure. say 2.5 billion could be put into a sinking fund? No, that was, a, that was something I had said before with respect to some of the other cash okay. that's already around. Okay. 
Gotcha. Uh, because particularly that, that $4.3 billion of cash that was unconstitutional borrowing, right? And then so, the, so it now it's talking specifically about the American Rescue Plan. You got the $2.5 billion I talked about as far as putting it into the unemployment insurance. Okay, and got it. And then, then, then another, say, $1.5 billion over a three-year period uh, that we can use, because it can be spent over a three-year period um, for capital projects, you know, for, you know, state, um, um, you know, uh, projects, you got uh, school projects that, you know, that could, that could be used for, um, we all know that uh, very significant issues in some of our schools around all areas of the state. You know, another billion dollars, we would say we'd go directly for uh, businesses and our nonprofits uh, in some sort of, you know, with the uh, EDA programs that have been out, we need, you know, the EDA, I think has done a pretty good job, uh, Tim Sullivan, of, you know, getting the money that they have out to the program, but the money, but, but it, they only can give out what they receive. Right. And unfortunately, it, it's been, the programs have been way oversubscribed and, and they uh, woefully underfunded. So that a billion, then I would say you got a, at least a half a billion um, you know, right around there that we all know the state computer systems oh, yeah. are horrible. <laughs> Anybody, and, and listen, I, you know, I, I've been since in the legislature and we've been talking, we're, we're 25 years behind business. Yep. Yep. So there's no, there's no need to like create a new roadmap. We, you know, people know, but we, the, the investment has to be there. All you have to do is look at the, you know, the motor vehicle situation, the unemployment uh, uh, insurance uh, you know, programming and and so many other our nine one one systems and stuff, and that's clearly right. things that can that can be used. Then we had a um, we would say another half a billion approximately for uh, expanded mortgage and and rental assistance uh, for um, you know landlords as well as you know uh, tenants. Um, not everybody has been significantly affected, but those who have been significantly affected by the pandemic. You got potential utility shutoffs. So there's a number of things, I think, for those people who have been, uh, uh, you know, affected by the pandemic. Now, unfortunately, with some of the moratoriums, and we know this as, as financial planners and, and CPAs and whatnot, that a lot of times if, if somebody is given the ability not to pay a bill, even though they can pay a bill, they'll use it for something else. Right. And unfortunately, we, you know, I think the state and, and not being strict enough as to who qualifies for some of these programs has created an unintended, you know, hazard for these people that, quite frankly, now when the governor uh, lifts the moratoriums, they had the money at the time. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to be faced with a big bill. And now they don't have the money because it went someplace else. Right. So that's and some, you know, as a financial planner, you're... you're I'm sure you warn your clients all the time not to do that kind of thing, but I'm sorry. I Absolutely. Digress. Right. Very, very, very true. And, and um, the last thing I would say is probably about the, uh, the last half billion or whatever uh, money is left. It's obviously in the hundreds of millions. We have about 200 school districts that are getting cut in school aid because of the changes in the, um, school funding, the S2 program. And this is not a time when any school should be having any kind of, you know, cuts in aid. Listen, I'm all for, um, you know, fiscal discipline and, and uh, uh, responsibility, but we all know that this has been a, you know, a heck of a, a heck of a period. Uh, so I do think that uh, for a period of time that we should hold our schools across the state, you know, uh, you know, at, the, at least the, at least the same level, um, and that they're so that they're not uh, quote unquote using uh, existing operating cash to you know for some of the additional expenses that they have to do right now because of the pandemic. Uh, we could, those are numbers that we could adjust a little bit here or there because, as you said, a lot of uh, the uh, local schools and the municipalities and the counties received a significant amount. So that, so that we, you know, we have to be, you know, flexible in that area, but we don't want to see any, I don't want to see any of our schools, you know, um, losing uh, or, or not taking the appropriate steps to obviously keep our students, our, our teachers, you know, uh, safe. Right. And I would assume that uh, $4 billion or so going to local governments 
uh, that a lot of that will be used for schools. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So maybe we'll have a year where property taxes don't go up as much, though somehow I doubt that. Um, I was surprised to learn last week that the uh, American Rescue Plan funds can be used by the governor unilaterally without, it, without any legislative approval. However, there has been an outcry from legislators of both parties that they want to have a say in how that money is spent. So do you think legislation will be passed as part of the budget to allow legislative input? Or is this going to be uh, another one of those long drawn out fights um, between the governor and the legislature? You know, Jeff, that's a very interesting question. And I was there when there was a surprise. And this is an issue we've brought up many, many times because there's, there's, and it's interesting, um, there is wording in the budget, in the Appropriations Act, that basically says, and it's really meant for, uh, say, a situation like Superstorm Standing. Something comes in very quickly. You, you've got it to be able to make uh, decisions very quickly. And in the early part of this pandemic, I would say that that was, that was true as well, right? But the legislature working with the governor, we showed that we could do things pretty quickly. But the real concern is that there is language in the appropriations bill that gives the authority to the governor, and this is any governor, it's not just the Murphy administration, it goes way right. back, that basically says that they can use any money coming from, uh, in the case of emergency from the federal government at their sole discretion. The only thing we got to do is take that wording out, right? Because you th and and then because the legislature has the responsibility, the constitutional responsibility for appropriations, so there can be wording uh, that said you know specifically for a a, a spe specific period of time. I want to be very very careful though, because when the appropriations bill, and that's why I think the easiest thing to do is just strike out the wording completely. And the legislature will, uh, will, will uh, react quickly if the governor needs it. Because um, uh, in any appropriations bill, the way it works is when it gets to the governor's desk, the governor can line item veto. And what that means is the governor can reduce amounts, numbers. You can't add, the governor can't add anything in, but they can also strike out words. So if, if there is, um, in a number of times, say, governor, can, uh, governor administration can get pretty cute by just striking out specific wording to, to give the, a sentence a completely different meaning. Right. So I, I just think it's, it's easy enough uh, that just take it out. Uh, we could put in wording uh, that the um, uh, legislature will act in an ex expeditious manner. Uh, in the event that, you know, there is a recurrence and say specifically with respect to the COVID-19. Do you, do you think the legislature will do that? What you just I'm said? Yeah, I'm, ho I, yeah I, I'm hoping that that that's what they do. I know uh, Senator, you know, Chairman Sarlo of the Budget Committee um, has been very adamant that um, and he's probably said it almost at every single, you know, uh, you know, budget meeting with the treasurer uh, when the treasurer has been there. Um, so he has voiced a uh, significant concern, concern about that. I know Senate President Sweeney uh, feels the same, the, the same way. So I, I am, I, I am hoping that uh, uh, we can, like I said, just strike out the wording or put in the wording that the, the, the legislature will work expeditiously with the, with the uh, Murphy administration or the, any, the governor's administration. Um, if there happens to be another state of emergency, like with respect to, we can name them, you know, if it happens to be a hurricane or something like that, that that's, a, that's a different kind of story um, right. in a situation where a super storm standee, you know, came about. Well, uh, one last thing on this issue. Has, uh, has Governor Murphy ind uh, indicated any resistance to this idea of sharing responsibility for the money? Um, I don't. I don't recall any kind of you know public uh, comment from the governor. But I will tell you, any governor is going to say they don't want to share much responsibility right. that they look at. You know, they're and it's the same argument we have 
as that I've been saying for a long time about we're a co-equal branch of government and we should be we shouldn't be on the sidelines, we should be in the game. Right, right. Okay. So as you know very well, I'm sure, businesses are having a very hard time finding low wage workers like uh, restaurant and retail employees, having a hard time getting them to come back to work. Many of these folks are receiving $300 weekly in federal unemployment benefits, which is going to continue to September. So you really can't blame them for choosing to get paid to not work something, you know, I think about that every now and then. Um, that being the case, how do we deal with this labor shortage? Is there anything the state can do? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, I think what the state can do is um, a, a number of parents are I was in, um, at home because, you know, there's been the hybrid school uh, situation. And we really do have to fix you know, the daycare situation. And uh, I, I really do congratulate Senator Sarlo um, and, and Senator Ruiz and Senator Singleton. At the beginning of the, of the process, um, when, the, when the Murphy administration really wasn't having any kind of like reopening meetings or anything, we held some uh, public hearings, uh, Senator Sarlo chaired them. And the first meeting we had was on the, uh, the childcare, you know, situation. And uh, after that public meeting, uh, the Murphy administration did relax its, um, it, you know, its mandates so that many of them could open up, at least on, on a limited basis. And then they, and they continued to relax, um, you know, the restrictions. So, but that, that's, that's a major issue. So people have to be able to go back to work, you know, and that means that your children have to be cared for somewhere. That, that being school or daycare, or even you know, obviously during the summer, and I know the uh, summer camps, you know, will be open, but there has to be the ability for a parent. Uh, you can't be leaving the children home alone. That's for sure, right? Um, and I think that's one of the critical things we have to we have to get done. The other thing is New, in New Jersey, the idea of collecting unemployment is you had to demonstrate that you were ready, willing, and able to go back to work. And unfortunately, the administration has. Um, you know, has relaxed those rules. And you, you, you'll see everybody that's out there, all the signs that are out there, you know, help wanted all over the place. Right. And quite frankly, um, we do need to, we, uh, it, it's time that we go back to that standard about being ready, re uh, willing and able, and able to work um, if you're going to certify that you're still, you know, an unemployment, right? And I think that's a, that's a, criti a critical issue. Um, and once, obviously, some of this other money that gets out under the American Rescue Plan, um, quite frankly, that, that will help, the, you know, I think, the situation, situation as well. Yeah, I know I went to a restaurant um, nearby on a Friday uh, afternoon for lunch uh, on a day off, and I, I used to have done that a lot of times before coronavirus, usually no wait at all or five minutes. There was an hour long wait. And I'm sure that is because they didn't have enough people there. So it's, it's affecting me personally. So we got to yeah. put an end to this. Um, so <coughs> liberal groups and legislators that don't buy the argument that uh, people and businesses are fleeing New Jersey due to high taxes they're citing new census data that just came out showing that the population of New Jersey grew by half a million people over the last 10 years. So what's your take on this? Uh, doesn't this demonstrate that there really isn't any out-migration problem? Well, first of all, you know, just using population as a gauge is, is not really the, you know, the best gauge. The best gauge is What's happened with capital streams? Like how, you know, net the net worth is, and there was a um, a study done, done by Boston College a bunch of years ago, and that's really something that I would hope a uh, some you know a research group or maybe Boston College, and I think it was done by the uh, um, I think it was the Chamber of Commerce, and I think it was also done by some of our nonprofits because they were losing a bunch of uh, charitable contributions. Right. So, uh, and that showed 
the issue of population, but it also showed the capital flows in and out of, of New Jersey. And I'm, I would hope that somebody would, would take up that study again. But population is not necessarily you know, the best um, indicator. Um, I, I, do think, I do think one of the reasons why uh, maybe capital has gotten better, and I do think it does affect the population as well, is that a number of years ago, we eliminated the estate tax. We got rid yep. of the estate tax. And the other thing we did, um, and this, you know, obviously Senator Sarlo, myself, Senator Sweeney, we all worked on a bipartisan basis uh, and eliminated the estate tax. We also raised the retirement income exclusion yep. to $100,000 for a joint, uh, for a couple filing a joint tax return. Uh, we also raised it uh, commensurately for uh, somebody who was single, somebody who had a household and whatnot. And then the other thing we did was uh, raise the uh, veterans exclusion, you know, for, uh, for um, you know, personal exemption. And so those are things that we had done. And I, I actually think that that has had a favorable impact uh, on our sales tax numbers. I think it's had a favorable impact on our income tax numbers. And I think um, once uh, some more of the data, the, you know, the, um, the granularized information about uh, the census data, as well as I said, that, the, that issue of capital flows is probably, I think the best indicator of, of, of anything. But I do think that um, the, from a positive standpoint, the, the elimination of state tax, the raising retirement income exclusion, which was, which was a big, um, uh, what can I say, uh, strategy and um, objective for Senator Sweeney. And I hope, I'm hoping that we can raise it still again. And maybe I'd love to see us get rid of any kind of tax on any kind of retirement because keeping our, our, our um, you know, senior, population uh, here is, first of all, I, I think it's one of the reasons why during the, the pandemic, uh, w- you know, many states and, and New Jersey didn't do nearly as, as bad as people had predicted because people who had, who had disposable income, they spent it and they really did help. They really did help uh, those businesses who were able to squeak by. You know, um, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Uh, But in that survey that we did of our members, and this sort of goes along with what you just said, um, even if there has been an increase of half a million people, they, uh, 70%, I think, said that they are seeing a a decrease in the number of high income uh, clients. So uh, I I think the, the issue is sure more people may be coming in but more high income people are leaving and you that's a major concern yeah that's and, a major concern i mean just having uh and you're the financial planner so you can help me with this it's something i've been wondering about if you have 500,000 people coming in and then let's say you have 20,000 uh wealthy people leaving I would think, and this could be totally wrong, that the 500,000 people coming in, sure, that's more revenues going to the state, but there's also a lot of state spending on those 500,000 people, whereas the 25,000 people listen, leaving who are bringing an awful lot of income, who are taking a lot of uh, income with them that's taxed at, as a, a tax at a high rate, don't require as much state spending. So you're really mainly just losing those 20,000 people and their money. Does that make any sense? Oh yeah. No, that, that's, well, that's been a big issue for a long time. And I, and I think I have to look back at the statistics, but I think, you know, 1% of the taxpayers pay nearly 40% of the income tax. Yeah, Uh, you're right. I forgot about that. So, so the, you know, there's always an issue of, of, of mix of if you're losing the high earners and, and obviously you, you're, you're bringing in, um, listen, New Jersey is a very welcoming state, but it, it's just a matter, of, it's a matter of fact that the higher uh, income earners provide the resources in order to uh, provide the safety nets and whatnot. So, the, so therefore, you, you absolutely have to keep in, you know, those kinds of, and we had, 
Um, remember that one year, uh, one of the individuals had left, and it's the first time I think I ever heard Office of Legislative Services say well, when that individual left that one individual was going to have a, you know, a, a big impact on the state budget. And that yeah. just gives you one example. One, right. you know, one, one example. Now, I understand you. that the individual may have come back and we're glad to have him back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he lives in the town next door uh, to my town. Let's turn to taxes and something you're very involved with, which is state taxation of remote workers. What's the status of New Hampshire's lawsuit filed with the U.S. Supreme Court in which they contested Massachusetts taxing of New Hampshire residents who are working online from home? Has the Supreme Court indicated if they will hear that case? The last, the last thing Jeff, that I know about this right now update um, is that um, they haven't indicated just yet, but they have asked from what I understand, the Solicitor the General um, in, in the um, uh, Attorney General's office to, to weigh in on, on the issue or get some information on the issue, which I, I think that shows that they've taken this, that they know that this is a very significant uh, concern for, for a number of states. Yep. It affects, it affects um, you know, if you take a you know, look at it, it probably directly affects over, I'm understanding over 2 million people, but, but in those states that it affects, because if, if just take the case in New Jersey, you said $2 billion, and that's, and that's probably, um, I think that's right around the right number, uh, because I think, it's, I think it's clearly about a billion dollars a year issue. Um, and I think it's an issue that's not gonna go away. You know, more right. and more people will. So um, it probably affects, you know, about a hundred million people because those states, and particularly states, a state like New Jersey, nine million people, they have about 400,000 people that are going across to work in, in New York. Um, and they pay about $4 billion worth of taxes. Those 400,000 pay about $4 billion wow. worth of taxes to New York, okay? That, uh, and, and so, and let's just say that's, 25% of that would be allocated to New Jersey. That's a billion dollars right yep. there, okay? Yeah. Um, and obviously, uh, when I talked to some of the bus companies uh, around here lately, I said, what's your average ridership right now? They said like 10%. So, so therefore, it's 90% of the people. Right. Who, who, but, and we do know that for a long period of time, there was, you know, um, most people were working, you know, remotely. Um, so it's, it's a huge issue. So I, the, the Supreme Court hasn't indicated just yet. But Jeff, there's more things that New Jersey should be doing and not mm -hmm. just waiting on the Supreme Court uh, because New York is extremely aggressive and New Jersey yeah. is very passive. And right. I'll just give you one case and something we can do immediately to help everybody and particularly those employees who would then save money. New Jersey still has on its division of taxation a the instruction basically telling New York employers to continue withholding New York taxes. And going back to last April, April of 2020, not I'm sorry, not April of 2021, April of 2020, I actually asked the Murphy administration, why do you have that in there? Because they said, you know, it, normally the way it works, if you're in New Jersey, you allocate the income to New Jersey and you allocate days to New York. Um, you know, the other days that you're physically in New York. New Jersey actually has an instruction that says, we are basically gonna uh, change that for the temporary period and, uh, and told the, the employers, continue sourcing the income as, as you normally do, right? Which says, New York, keep withholding taxes on New Jersey residents. This is no temporary situation. It hasn't been temporary. And unfortunately, as I said, New York has always been very aggressive. Yeah. And let's, so let's face it, Governor Cuomo knows the more money he gets from people from out of state, the less money he has to get from his own people. Right. And, right. and I am so passionate about this because, Jeff, this is a billion dollar issue. It's going to continue to be a huge issue because as, you know, telecommunicate, I, I read an article as um, uh, today that said, 70% of the people uh, are going to be asking their employers to allow them to have more, you know, telecommuting. 
uh, maybe not full time, right. but you know, uh, at least a good, you know, a decent percentage of time. Yeah. And this is real money. And what we use this money for, Jeff? You want to talk about property help in our property tax yeah. relief? That money goes into the property tax relief fund, which is K to twelve education, homestead rebate, and senior freeze program. That's all property tax stuff. Right. Right. So, Senator, I know you have a very uh, busy schedule today as, as well as the rest of the week. So uh, I want to thank you for, you know, being with us again today. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you are one of our favorite legislators. Uh, <laughs> the only CPA. <laughs> the only CPA, but we would love you anyway. Um, anyway. Uh, again, thank you, and uh, I want to let you uh, run on to your next appointment. Jeff, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you.